Welcome to the Black Sheep Podcast, brought to you by BBH. I'm your host, writer and performer, Daniela Isaacs. We want to know what it really means to be a black sheep and work out how we can all get a bit better at going against the grain. We're going to be asking some of our favourite black sheep about the rules they've broken to get them where they are today. Black Sheep is a podcast about rules and how to break them. Our black sheep today is John Anthony Lord Bird. Lord John is an entrepreneur, not just any entrepreneur. He's an incredibly impressive social change entrepreneur, best known as the founder of The Big Issue, a magazine that has become such a significant part of Britain's mantelpiece. The magazine is edited by professional journalists and sold by street vendors who are homeless or vulnerably housed. He was born into a very poor London Irish family, living in a West London estate, becoming homeless by the age of five. Excuse me, it wasn't a West London estate. Oh, what was it? It was a slum. A slum, sorry. It was a slum. It wasn't a, it wasn't local authority. Slum. A slum. Residing in orphanages between the age of seven and ten, and soon becoming a regular in prison, stealing to supplement his income as a butcher boy. It was while he was in prison... Sorry, I was a butcher boy for about three weeks. And then? Uh, then I got sick for stealing meat. Actually, it was sausages. Really? So I worked for the Queen's Butchers. Uh, it was called Cobb & Co in Knightsbridge. And they'd worked it out that I was filching the sausages and giving giving them to a mate of mine who worked in a greengrocer's around the corner. And then so, from there? Carried well, on? So, well, I mean, it was downhill. But the, so, the butcher's boy sounds really grand, but I wasn't one long enough to to be given the appellation butcher's boy. All right, so I've I've made an error there, but you I'll, have, I'll call have. I'll I'll label you a but, butcher boy for three weeks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Erstwhile butcher's boy. And it was while he was in prison that John learnt to read and write. Then let's fast forward all the way to September 1991. Lord John launched The Big Issue with Gordon Roddick, co-founder of The Body Shop. And then in November 1995, he launched The Big Issue Foundation to further support The Big Issue vendors. The Big Issue magazine started as a London venture, but expanded with specific editions and services to other British cities and then to other countries too. In 2009, Big Issue Invest launched a social investment fund and has since invested more than £30 million in hundreds of social enterprises across communities within the UK. Lord John was nominated as a People's Peer by the House of Lords in October 2015 and then was given the title Baron Bird or Lord Bird of Notting Hill in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. In Lord John's maiden speech, he stated... Someone said to me, how did you get into the House of Lords? And I said, by lying, cheating and stealing. Brilliant. (laughs) Um, I could fill up more time listing Lord John's achievements, but I hope he's going to unveil even more of it as we speak today. Hello, John. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. No, thank you for coming here. I guess the first question which we always kick off with is, have you always seen yourself as a black sheep? God. Um, Well, I never fitted in. Uh, and it was interesting, um, you know, because, for instance, one of the things uh, I could never do is I could never gang up with other boys and beat one individual up. Mm-hmm. So I've always had this um, hatred of gangs, um, and I've had loads of fights with gangs over the years for people who pick. So that was very strange because in the kind of slummy London Irish Notting Hill, they're always little groups of people beating up one person. And I think this might be because my father used to beat my mum up. And that was absolutely terrible. And mm. I felt very, very powerless. I was very fortunate when I came out of Nick at the age of 18 to give my dad a good kick in. And he never touched her again. So wow. I've always felt that I didn't like the violence. I didn't like the culture. I didn't like uh, anything about being in poverty, so I never fitted in. Then when I was in the orphanage, I never fitted in. It was a Catholic orphanage where they spent an enormous amount of time telling us that we were the big mistakes, that our parents were chaotic and drunks, which they were, Mm. um, and they were unreliable. 
and I never fitted in. I could never see my parents, even though I didn't agree with them, uh, in that kind of light. Um, and then when I was uh, at school, I never fitted in at school, never liked school, uh, hated the teachers, hated everybody, and uh, didn't like the, uh, you know, the kind of ganging up again and the, um, you know, grassing up of each other. So actually the only place I've ever really felt at home, and this sounds ridiculous, is the House of Lords. Mm. Because the thing is, the House of Lords, uh, unlike the House of Commons, is full of people who've done incredible things. You know, they've been doctors or they've worked in Africa uh, or they've worked in deep misery, they've worked with the disabled, they've worked with all that. Of course, there's other lords and baronesses who have inherited it and I don't meet those mm. because they're not in my milieu. My milieu, I meet the doctors, I meet the lawyers, I meet the people who fight for human rights and we are, and there's probably three or four hundred of us who were very, very active in each other's pockets and trying to do things long term about social injustice and stuff like that and the planet. Um, and I feel, and they respect me and I don't have to perform. Mm. Whereas everywhere else, you, one is almost performing how one expects. I think the thing about a black sheep is a black sheep, if if a, if it's a true black sheep, because I think you get those black sheep who run away and invent a new perfume or a new pair of trousers or mm. something like that. They're not black sheep. They're just following the capitalist marketplace. Um, you know, trying to suggest that Levi's or some of those companies are black sheep companies because they kick over the traces or Tommy Hilfinger. I mean, that's all. The black sheep are the people who are playing the music that nobody, that people turn their backs on until they get it. Mm. They're the artists who who uh, are doing strange things and then people will eventually get it. They're the, they're the people who are down there helping the disabled and, and eventually people realise they've got to do something about it. So the black sheep are very real people, but they're not simply the people who get the publicity. I'd love us to travel up to the point where you were able to embrace... I could get very sick. I could see myself getting very sick. Yeah, I like it. I'd I like better it. tell a joke. No, no, no. No Can't jokes I tell needed. a joke? Oh, please. This is <laughs> My brother was walking along the road the other day and somebody threw a, a, a cheddar cheese at him. Mm. And he turned around and says that. That's not very mature, is it? Oh, dear. No, can we cut the jokes? I want the intense deep. I, I want oh, to please, learn. Oh, just one joke. <laughs> I'm not going to listen um, to this unless I'm allowed a joke. All right, you, you're allowed right. some jokes peppered in throughout. One joke, one joke. Right. I'm really desperately trying to think of a cheese pun, but I'm not great at it. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, um, will you throw us in with your first rule that you have broken? <laughs> Well, uh, my first rule is listen to your parents. The thing is, if I'd listened to my parents, I would be a racist, small-minded... Uh, well, I probably would... I, I would probably have been somebody who just gave up and accepted the fact that I was um, below the working classes and it was everybody else's fault that uh, there were grief in the world and I would have uh, just been uh, a person who behaved himself and went to school and did all sorts of stuff and then got a job on a building site uh, labouring and then you know 40 years later died of you know too much drink or something like that so the first rule was I turned against my parents and I realised that my parents were were almost a part of this system that, you know, everybody behaves themselves, everybody's in a system. Mm. And I've tended to kind of try and break systems. There is no point in reinventing the world again. There's no point in, you know, reinventing the wheel again. And what the world is often full of are people who say, I've come up with this fantastic idea and I'm going to build this brilliant school or this academy... And they go on and they get really excited. Mm. And it's wonderful. Until you realise there's hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people doing that all over the world. 
but the energy is never converged mm. and you never actually get rid of the poverty associated with illiteracy. You never get rid of the poverty that is associated with uh, uh, people living in poor social conditions or the fact that they never learn the skills. So I'm one who wants to break systems and the existing system where everybody just gets on with their job, I think needs to be changed. And I'm listening to my 12 year old daughter who is a supporter of Greta Thunberg. I'm listening to my 14 year old son who's a, a supporter of Greta Thunberg. I'm listening to uh, people who were saying, you know, if we don't sort the world out, there won't be a world for our children, let alone our grandchildren. And when you were growing up, considering your first rule, did you feel like your parents weren't listening to you? I never had any problems with my parents. I just totally ignored them. And in fact, I have been married three times. And I've had many, many girlfriends. And I've met so many people who are, in a sense, controlled by their parents, disappointed in their parents. Mm. I was never disappointed in my parents. My parents gave me jack shit. And I'm really pleased that they gave me jack shit. In the end, I fell in love with them. I fell in love with the fact that they were cast in a particular mould to fail uh, and not to be able to respond to opportunity. In the end, I forgave them their trespasses against me and the world. But I never felt I was let down by my parents. I never felt, I, I, you know, and I do mean, I mean, somebody said to me the other day, Oh, I'm really, really upset with my mum still controlling me and I'm almost 50. And I said, thank God you got a mum. My mum died when I was 25, mm. 26. Mm. I'd love my mum to be alive now to tell me what an ass I was making of my life. I would love it. Mm. I'd love a conversation. People don't value their parents until they're brown bread. And I would absolutely love to see my dad uh, even though he would probably be going on about something I wouldn't agree with. I would love to have an argument with him. And being, there comes a time when you have to stop being controlled by your parents. And most people I know seem, oh, I've got to go and see my dad this weekend. And I say, well, why don't you arrange somebody to assassinate him? Uh, or, or why don't you just send him a lot of hamburgers and mm. then he can eat them and he can die? Mm. You know, um, so anyway, but I'm wondering there I never had any problem with my parents they were as thick as two short planks they never did anything for me and I love them for it and at what age or have you got like a significant memory where you remember breaking their rules the rules that they enforced upon you well my mother was a devout Catholic which meant she never went to church and my dad was a Protestant and he made us go to church because mm. he'd signed the papers. <laughs> so I, I always stuck. I was, a, I was a devout Catholic until I got to 18. So I always stuck to those rules, and they were from my parents because I, I was a cradle Catholic. Yeah. Um, but the other rules uh, about work, I never, I did all I could to avoid work. And what were those rules? Well, they were, you know, you get up in the morning, you go off to work, and you earn your money and you don't nick anything. And I was always trying to nick stuff. I was always trying to find something. So I I didn't, or I didn't go to school. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I couldn't read and write. Right, so you ignored them. You didn't go to school. Didn't you didn't to get school, the job that they wanted you to... Didn't go, didn't... When I did leave school at the age of 15, and I'd already, I'd been told by the headmaster not to come to school, I was excluded at the age of 14 for fighting with other... Um, you know, hitting other people. Um, and I'd been in a place called a detention centre, which was a, a boys' prison. And I'd come out and I was really... I mean, they made you very evil because that was, that was very strange. They sent you away to these places to get you to behave and you come out and you're, you're just much better at misbehaving. Mm. And I came out and I, I was always in grief. So they, the headmaster took me aside and said, don't come to school. So I didn't go to school for the last six months. And I hadn't been going for the last six years or something, on and off. Um, and then I eventually legally could leave school and get a job. And I had about seven jobs in about three months. And then I got done for receiving money under false pretenses. 
and then I went and for the next six months slept rough and uh, lived in the streets of mm. London and other places. Um, but I never, I, I never believed that I was there simply to work to make money for the man, as mm -hmm. we used to call it, making money for the man, which was making money for somebody else. I never believed that was my role in life. And my dad and my mum believed that that was the only thing that was on offer. Can you j jump us into rule two? Oh, yes, tell the truth. Tell I, the truth? Yeah, I was told to tell the truth. But I've always been, um, should we say, economic with the truth. Even now, I'm a born liar. And I've been lying all of my life. I've lied to everybody I know. I've lied about all sorts of stuff. And obviously, with the passage of time, they get less harmful. You know, I, I don't lie about my commitment to social justice. I don't lie about my fight against homophobia and racism and anti-Semitism and all that stuff. I don't lie about that. But I find myself uh, still wanting to exaggerate, which is a form of lying. Mm. <laughs> but So it's kind of it built in with me, but I did learn earlier on that actually if you do want to get anywhere in the world, you've got to start being able to take the truth and turn it on its head. So you have to make yourself look stronger and more in control. So when I got the money from the, the body shop uh, to start the big issue, I pretended, oh, yes, 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 I'm totally in control of everything. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, I know entirely what to do. Oh, yes, yes. I know all about discipline. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know about rough sleeping and because I'd been a rough sleeper. And, and I really bigged up my mm. expertise. But it was all hollow and shallow. But in the end, I became the expert because I got the time to learn on the job. And I think there's, uh, I think people think the truth is something immovable. And actually, one man's truth is another person's lie. And so, for instance, you can be truthful. I'm not recommending we all go out robbing each other. But the point is, you've got to realize that the very process of living in the world is to try and in a way, get over the fact that things are probably stacked against you. Most of us have things stacked against us. And to get around that, you've got to kind of play with the truth. So do you sometimes lie in order to achieve your vision? Mm. Yes. Yeah, I do. I know I have. I did it with the big issue. And I've done it with other things. Uh, I did it before that. Um, when I was, um, when I started a print company and my first big job was with an American airline called Pan American Airways. And, uh, they wanted me, Pan American Airways was buying national airlines in America and they needed a, a, a book of all the flights for their 150 offices all over the, U, the world. And they came to me and I, I pretended I had all the equipment and boom, boom, boom. And I could, I did the job. I did it perfectly. They couldn't do the job. Mm. But, and I did it by working for three nights without stopping and employing a mate of mine who was a drunken printer mm. who I managed to sober up. And I got him and I, so I lied and I cheated and I printed all the, and I got this letter from the, vice president of the Pan American Airways saying it was the best job. Unfortunately, they closed soon afterwards, but they paid me. Mm. So I've always been like bigging myself up. I did another job where uh, it was for an international conference where I did all their conference papers and it looked brilliant until they popped round my house and they saw there was me doing all this work, having my kids helping me, having my neighbors and all that. And they said, we thought you had a modern office. I said, it will be. Mm. So, you know, so in terms of business, you you have to kind of pretend that you're, you've got more in the kitty than you have and you've got more, oh, yeah, you're doing very, really well. Has it ever turned on you? Oh, God above, yes. I mean, uh, I, I, well, I mean, personally, I mean, like lying. Uh, I, I One particular occasion, I, I, I was with a mate of mine. We were down in Cornwall. 
and we were just piddling around and we went to see a mate of his who was a poet, a very well-known Scottish poet called W.S. Graham. And we went to see him and my mate said, I told my mate that I wanted to be a poet and I'd got all these uh, uh, books that Faber and Faber were going to publish. Mm. I was about 23, pl you know, playing at poetry. And he told this poet who had struggled all his life to get one or two books published and live. His, his, his wife had to clean holiday cottages. And here he said, oh, yes, my, he, he spoke with a very posh voice. He said, yes, my, my friend Bertie, he's an absolute marvellous poet. He's just got three, um, three books coming out from Faber and Faber. And they've given him, I think it was about three or four hundred pounds advance. And W. S. Graham got, Oh, God a pub. So anyway, afterwards we left the pub and we went back to his house and he stopped me and he said he said in his thick Scottish action, You're not coming in here. You can piss off. And I went, I'm coming in. So he punched <gasps> me on the nose, knocked me over, and I got up and I said, Is that all you can do? Anyway, we became friends. <laughs> but I often thought, what a lying I mean he's a brilliant, beautiful poet. Why did I have to lie? Mm. And, and so sometimes I'd feel afterwards, I thought, oh God. And, you know, I'd meet, I'd meet women and told them that I'd, you know, I had just had a big exhibition at the Royal Academy because I used to paint and draw and all that stuff. And I, I, I don't want to, don't make me remember all my mm. lies, please. <laughs> I'm enjoying them. Lies. I... But, but the truth, what you've got to realize is that sometimes, you don't want to be letting the truth out. You need to, a bit like uh, what Winston Churchill said, the the truth is so pure that it has to be defended by a phalanx of lies. And sometimes you can't let the truth out. Uh, and I think that's often to be found in politics and all that. You don't need to be telling people things uh, at a time when it would destroy them, for instance. Mm. My... my my mother was never told at the end that she was dying of cancer. I mean, she worked it out in the end because she was, you know, incapable of getting out of bed. But if she'd known before, she'd have driven us all hysterical and she probably would have probably died early. Mm. But um, I remember Miriam Magoulas yeah. said, that, said a wonderful thing. She said uh, she'd, she wishes she'd never told her mother that she was a lesbian because she felt it pushed on her death. And I thought that was really a wonderful sign of sometimes, you know, older people or people who were not in the know, you know, they don't understand. You know? Over the years, have you worked out, or are you still working on it, when you should mm. stick to your truth and when it's okay to bend the truth? I'm, I'm now much, much more truthful, but because, because I'm a bit of a storyteller, I kind of sometimes tell the same story. And people say, oh, yeah, but last time this mm. happened, I say, oh, God, and I get caught out. Uh, but that's because I'm a motor mouth as well. But what um, do you think your instinct is? Like, why do you think your instinct is to bend the truth? Do you think you wouldn't have been able to get where you've got yeah. if you hadn't? Very early on, I realised that if you want to get on in life, it's not just enough to be able to, to read and write literacy. You have to have social literacy, and social literacy is small talk. Yeah, it's having a drink with somebody in a pub who you don't know. It's talking to people, and this social literacy is often, you know, the gift of the gab, you know, exaggerating things to make them into stories to break down your relationships with people so that you can come together. So I do feel that social literacy, which is the whole point behind the new magazine chapter catcher which is to get people into literacy but then to get them to be more uh, able to communicate mm. with other with each other and if you haven't got social literacy it's plainly obvious and you know you you will be frozen out i wanted to write a book once but i couldn't get a publisher called small talk your way to the top because i've used small talk and i've used you know jokes and Mm. saying risque things to people and it's oh yeah that John Bird's really interesting and you know before you know it you're you're in the house of lords but the truth needs to be fought for the true truth which is that we have this weird world where 35 36 percent of our children fail at school and they be they're the ones who fill up the prisons as I was saying and they're the ones who 
who die earlier have long-term unemployment problems, fill up the A&E. It is. I mean, virtually all of the people I've ever met who are in grief and trouble in society are people who've never done well at school. Rarely you will meet, you know, I mean, everybody says, oh, anybody could be homeless or anybody could be in prison. But when you scrub down, they nearly are always people who, who've had a hard time at school. So how do you think that we learn or can we learn social literacy and how did you learn it? Well, I think I think by reading is one of the ways. Reading, discussing. I, I, the reason I've concentrated in Chapter Catcher on reading is because, as Stephen Fry said the other night, it's the one thing that doesn't cost a lot of money mm. that can bring people. And actually, if you can't read particularly well, you can begin to improve your ability to read by reading. And how did you learn to read? Well, I had this really weird thing. I could read certain words. And from a very early on, uh, 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 early on in life, I could understand certain words. But I couldn't make the meaning. What was it meaning? You know, you got on a plane and you went to Constantinople or something like that. I would understand the plane. I'd understand got. I might. Even, I would understand consonant. Antinople, but I wouldn't know the meaning of the sentence. So I was always stumbling through. I mean, we had exams at school and I would stumble through and get mm -hmm. nowhere. Mm. Uh, and it was only the technical exams I could pass, you know, like the sums, because sums are not words, and the technical drawing, which I was quite good at. But I could never, ever really say I could read and write. And then and it really hurt me that I couldn't say that to anybody. And I left school and then I was in this, got three to five years and then uh, ran away and smashed up a car at 102 miles an hour and ended up in a boys' prison, another place. And I met a screw and the screw gave me a book and said, uh, do you want, well, he said, do you want a book? And I said, well, I didn't really want to, it was very difficult reading books what would you want to be sitting in a cell by yourself, stumbling through a book? Mm. So he said, well, underline all the words you don't understand. And when he came back three days later, he said, God, he said, these are all the silly little words like them, there, there, therefore. And I said, well, they're the ones I... And it was wonderful being with uh, a screw who I could admit, yeah, I can't really read that well. And then when he, after only really a matter of weeks, maybe even a month or something. I had the confidence. He gave me confidence. It wasn't his job. His job was to stop me committing suicide or running away mm. or stabbing somebody else, you know. It sounds like he was one of the first people that you could be truly yourself with because you just said at school mm. you were too ashamed, perhaps, to say I can't read or it wasn't a cool thing to read in the first place. Whereas with him, you were able to actually say, I don't know how to do this. Can you help? Well, not being able to read and write didn't stop you getting a job with a shovel or a spade on a building site. So it wasn't really that important. I mean, reading and writing didn't affect you getting around London if you knew all the tube stops. You yeah. get off the tube stops you know, by road, or you get the buses. And so nothing was impaired. Meeting girls, it didn't, you know, you'd meet a girl at 14 or 15 and she wouldn't really want to be talking about Tolstoy. Mm. Um, um, and the fact that you couldn't read or write didn't really matter. It, you know, did you look like Elvis Presley or you did, didn't you? Um, so all those sorts of things, there was no real reason to learn to read and write. And actually, my mum and dad, who learnt to read and write, because they went to proper schools in the 20s and the 30s, and they were made to, you know, um, they ended up, my mum used to read True Romance, <laughs> which was full of pictures of men who met ladies down alleys, or, or I don't know what happened down there, or, or flew, I mean, maybe it was a bit more romantic. And then my dad used to read True Detective, and it was full of, photographs of dismembered women mm. that had been found in railway stations here and there. And I was convinced my dad was a murderer. I, I thought he'd go out at night and murder women. Uh, but there you had it. They'd, they'd actually, they, they lived 
the crisis of reading, which is they'd learnt to read and write, but then what they read was shit. Yeah. Am so, I allowed to say that? Of course you are. <laughs> so I guess it's um, making people aware of the... Mm. Of kind of how to be social literacy. Yeah. Every one of us uses about 10, 15, I don't know, 20% of our brain. We have enormous skills and abilities and we don't use them. And most people who learn to read and write then don't turn it in a wep into a weapon for social justice, social change, social opportunity, self improvement. People go, I mean, I'm the same, you know, I mean, I, I, we did a mind map a few years ago. My wife said, "My wife's a very lovely lady who who believes in rules, and of course, uh, I'm always moving the rules." You mm -hmm. know? <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> and she says to me, uh, "She said, let's mind map what you want to do over the next couple of years." So we mind map. I was going to learn French, Italian, and German, and. You know, it, the only reason I remember this is because we made a little film of it and I saw it yesterday. I thought, oh, God, how far have we got there? Yeah. You know, so I'm just... But I spend most of my time reading around philosophy, religion, politics, um, and I don't read an awful lot of fictions, mm. but I should read more fiction because it, it's it's like, as I said in the, um, in the introduction to the magazine... Uh, chapter catchers, reading should be a bit like going out for a bracing walk with some huskies. Did you read that? Yeah. Good. Well, can you explain what you mean by that, though, in more detail? Well, re reading should be muscular. It should be, you know, it should be full of beauty. It should make you feel deeper, make you feel more connected with the trees or the, the world around. John, can you tell me your third rule, please? <laughs> Follow the experts. Well, I've never followed the experts in my life. When we started The Big Issue, I was called before a committee of experts. It was wonderful. It was the greatest day of my life. <laughs> Here were all these experts, and there was about, I don't know, about 30, 40 of them, and they represented the 501 homeless organisations in operation in London, in 1991 and the leading person who's still around and is still a leading person in social justice said uh, John um, it's strange you know nobody knows you in the housing or the homeless field no one knows you you know you you know you haven't we, we don't know you've got a degree or whatever you haven't done this you know anology and poverty or whatever well no no one knows about you you know and all the experts you know they uh, so, who are you? You could be a second-hand car dealer mm. or winner. And you want to give homeless people an opportunity of making their own money. This is ridiculous. The experts don't agree with you. And I said, well, just for once, just maybe once, just once, one, just for one moment, why don't we let somebody who has had the experience of homelessness run a homeless project. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be marvellous? Wouldn't that be glorious? And I went like this, and they shit themselves. Mm. Because these were experts who were experts in what? In moving, uh, moving budgets around, experts in lifting people off the streets and giving them a handout and not a hand up. Mm. And then I said the other thing, which which was the experts, when they said, oh, you, the other argument was, well, you know, these people you're talking about on the streets have got an, a, a kind of a, a menu of social failure. There's uh, all sorts of problems. And if you give them money, they'll only spend it on drink or drugs. And uh, what you'll do is you'll just hasten their end. And I said, well, what's happening at the moment? I said, what's happening with the people in the hostels? What's happening with the people in the streets? I'll tell you what's happening. They're doing drink and drugs. But they're robbing old ladies. They're breaking into houses. They're shoplifting. They're using aggressive begging. They're breaking into cars. 
So what you got is you got their problem added to their criminality. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody came along and said, you can, you can actually have your gear and have your drink and the only person you're harming is yourself. Mm. And you decriminalize them. And then you begin the process of uh, getting them out of the grief. And as a consequence, has the use of drink and drugs associated with big issue vendors decreased? It's changed. It's moved on. The big issue itself is is a lot different from when it was largely about street homelessness. It's now a lot of it's about prevention. A lot of it is about trying to stop people falling down again. And we have been working resolutely with a lot of people who've come in from Europe, especially Romanians, uh, because they were allowed into the country by that strange gentleman, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tony Blair, who said, you can come into the country, but you can't have a job. Uh, you have to be independently wealthy uh, or you have to be self-employed. Now, no one has ever, ever, ever said to immigrants before, whether they were Jews, or Huguenots, Irish people, Jamaicans, they never said, come in here and you can't work. Because what do you do then? You prepare them for illicit activities. And that is why Jamaicans and Jews and Irish people and Huguenots and all the other people who've come in, they always got the crap jobs, the shit jobs at the bottom, and then they work their way out of it. The, the Bangladeshis did it, the, um, uh, the Hong Kong Asians did it, the other people, the, 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 the Asians kicked out by in Kenya coming here with, with probably, you know, five quid, worked their, well, they started doing the, the crappy jobs and they worked their way out of it. So therefore, actually, there's nothing wrong with poverty as long as you can get out, with, out of it. And it strengthened these people and it meant they could rise. And that is the beauty of immigration. It is so enriched our lives. But when you somebody comes in and says, no, you cannot become a prosperous person in this per, in this country, then you chop their legs off. And I said, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with J Romanians and I've worked with Bulgarians. I've worked with Italians who got stuck over here. I've worked with anybody. I, I don't care. My, my I started the big issue in in mani manifestly in imitation of my own life, which is when I started working, I stopped theming. Mm. So it's a crime prevention program. You're talking, understandably, like an expert now. Would you regard yourself as, as an expert? Uh, yeah, I'm an expert. I'm posh as well. Um, uh, but if you're telling people not to trust experts, is there a kind of... Well, when you say don't trust an expert and you get on a plane and some bloke says, oh, I'm going to fly this plane... What are you going to do? You're, you're going to let him fly it. You're going to try, try it. If you go into the hospital and the hospital doctor says, I'm going to have to cut you open to get that out, you're going to try it. So it's not so much don't trust experts, but don't rely mm -hmm. that because somebody's an expert, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that, I, socially, I think we've had too many experts who uh, have turned out to be... My expertise is is open to interpretation mm -hmm. and I've got it wrong on too many occasions to to say this is the way to do it and I'm always cheesing people off who who are more expert than me and would you ever seek out an expert oh yeah of course I would a certain certain time in the house of lords I've met, I've met many experts and I would seek them out there's a, a woman who I work I've done some work with who really knows about mental health and I'm not too, it's not an area that I've done an awful lot of work on and I'm very interested in extending our work into mental well-being and mental health. So who do you work out who to listen to and who not to? Well, you don't. You just have to find out. And, but you have to keep, you know, the jury's always out when it comes to experts and some of the experts will be dead right and some of the experts will be right at some occasion mm -hmm. and wrong at others. John, last question. When somebody <laughs> loves you, 
I don't want a song yet. I want one um, rule. It takes a whole lot of love. <laughs> one rule, please, that you will never break. Never grass anyone up. And grass up is snitch on them. Um, it's a rule that I've stuck to. And on, a, on occasions, if I'd grassed somebody up when I was 15, I wouldn't have got three to five years. And it would have been easy to shift the blame for an event because I was very secondary. And the, ter- the first person, the premier, wrongdoer, I had to take his crime because I wouldn't grass him up. And his crime was, my crime really was receiving, Mm -hmm. and his crime was actually stealing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the law looks at that slightly differently, and they'd have said, ah. And also the old Bill would have said, ah, you know, he's a good, he's he's one of us, he's grassed up his mates. And I could have stopped, um, you know, I could have got out of being banged up really from the age of 15 to the age of 21. I mean, I got out before them for good behaviour, but the, but it, and I could have done that on quite a number of occasions, being caught, you know, housebreaking. Uh, that was uh, I got done for housebreaking, and the seven other people were involved in it. I was the only one sent down for it, and the seven other people um, uh, got away with it. And the old Bill kept on and on and on saying. You know, who were they? And I said, I don't know. I said, you know, I was uh, I was asleep at the time or something. Like that. I don't know what I think. Mm. I, said, I think I think I was wearing a pair of fishnet tights <laughs> over my eyes or whatever people. And, and loads of other occasions when I wouldn't, you know. And it's quite interesting. The first thing, the first time I got nicked, I was 10 for shoplifting. I wasn't shoplifting. I was standing outside. My mate was in shoplifting and he stole a ball. And this is how it all begins. He stole a ball, rammed it up his um, up his um, jumper. And I said, don't go in there and steal a ball because you'll get caught. And he was caught. And he said, it's not just me, it's him. Mm. And I ran away back to school. And then the old bill came and they made it. I mean, this was like, five shillings, you know, a quarter, 25 pence worth mm. of... And, but the, they were such arseholes in those days. The way they treated the young, oh, it was terrible. And what stopped you blaming, ever? Blaming who? Anyone else other than yourself. What stopped you? Well, no, I mean, uh, this guy, who I still remember his name, if I ever see you, <laughs> I shall. Uh, he was a real slimy, low-life piece of excrescence uh, I think I learned very early on that poverty and, and no, nobility were not the same thing but people used to go on about that mm. uh, no I, I but there are occasions when I found myself erring towards maybe saying something about somebody and I thought well, if I do that mm. I thought, oh, no, no. And then I think of the implications. And I couldn't live with myself. If And if there's anybody out there who I've grasped up, please send me your name and address and I'll send you a cheque for £15. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. You are a trailblazer of a black sheep. Thanks. Thank you. I knew I was. <laughs>